uh, improving reproducibility through better software practices. We've talked um, in this conference a lot about uh, different software practices that people are using, and 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 I'm going to talk about um, reproducibility as kind of one of the big motivating um, driving factors that that is really helping us to focus that work and and get a clear idea of you know, why it is that we're building these tools and and what we're accomplishing with them. That's that's uh, that's great and is is building our the system better. Uh, here's our preferred citation format. I can start this one with a the brief look at terminology. There's just a uh, couple of things I want to note. First, there's a lot of um, different words that that mean slightly different things um, and help you wrap your head around reproducibility. For the purpose of these this talk, um, all these slight differences aren't going to be super important. But if you're going to read up on the you know the, the scientific reports that came out of um, you know, compatible reproducibility tax taxonomy or or the um, um, the National Academy of Science report on the importance of reproducibility and replicability in science. Um, you might run across the terms reproducible and replicable. Um, and I should note that they mean slightly, that, that, that they're meant to mean um, two different graduation, you know, gradual um, increasing strictness requirement on, on reproducibility, but their, their definition has changed over the years. So there were two communities that used them in exactly different ways. And so if you look at um, literature that's that's maybe a couple of years old, you might see them used um, inconsistently with how they're used now. However, uh, that situation has changed. And so the, there's, you know, um, people are in the process of switching their terminology over so that reproducible means um, that, that another team can obtain the same result using the same experimental environment. And replicable is a little bit stricter um, where another team can obtain consistent results using a different experimental environment. Um, and I'll point you to these links. Um, in the chat, you'll notice that there is a, um, there's a link to our kind of online material associated with this tutorial. And that online material has a page with all these links in it because I know the links don't come through Zoom. Um, so if you wanna use the link instead of having to type very quickly, um, you can browse our online material and get to the links there. Okay, so, now we'll have um, kind of, I'll start off with why reproducibility is important. And, and I know I'm preaching to the, the choir a little bit here, but you can take these and you can share them with everybody and, and tell them, you know, they all need to work on reproducibility because it's important. Um, <clears throat> there had, there's, and I think it's pretty well known um, now that there was a, a study a couple of years back um, from the cognitive science literature that where researchers took a hundred articles that had been published in their field, and they tried to reproduce the, the results of those 100 studies. And it turned out they could only actually reproduce 40 of them. Um, and, and that was kind of a, an eye opener for, for having 60 results now, which, are, have, which have this um, status of, of having to be redone or you know, reworked because it, they can't be used as, as the basis for future experiments. If, if you're not able to reproduce the results, how can you be sure that you can build on that result? We might think that we've escaped this in, um, in the, the physical science or in computation. And, um, and we, we haven't necessarily uh, similar, uh, we have problems whenever we have issues trusting the software that's producing our science. Uh, so one of the, the key takeaways here is that um, the science the computation, the scientific results from computation are only as good as the software that produced them. And um, here's an example of, of something that, um, that happened a couple of years back. In 2009, there was a study from a group at Princeton showing that there were two different phases of liquid water between negative 40, where, where it just definitely freezes to ice, and zero, where it should freeze to ice eventually. And so the super cool region of water um, and their simulation model had two different liquid phases with two different densities. And later on, um, a couple of years later, there was another group that did a simulation of, of supercooled water and found out that there was only one phase, a high density phase. The two results, of course, disagreed and, and they had to figure out exactly uh, what the disagreement was and whether it was two or one phase. And so the dependent any group um, looked at the, the Chandler paper, which says, okay, the lamps code, uh, this the second paper says the lamps code 
is a standard and documented, and R scripts for running it are freely available upon request. So of course, uh, Debitted and Group asked for the code um, with his colleague Palmer, and it wasn't uh, necessarily forthcoming until some um, appeals to the editor of Nature. When uh, Palmer finally got this code and looked through it and reproduced the, the second result, um, he realized that there was actually a feature that, that the Berkeley group used in the Lance execution to speed up the, the execution of the algorithm. But that, that feature, which sped up the, the running time of the code, ended up, um, time. okay, that feature ended up um, actually changing the physics of the result. And what was even worse, and the resolution took seven years, and, and what was even worse is that there's no way you could have actually known um, whether the result was correct or not, because you couldn't reproduce it just by reading the paper. Um, so, so it is actually uh, really important to, to publish these appendices in your papers that explain you know, how do you exactly go about reproducing your scientific results. Um, and unless we think this is related to HPC numerical codes in C++, um, there is also a story of an NMR, um, an NMR library that's used to interpret data from NMR experiments that uses a standard, um, standard library from Python called glob. And glob just you know, returns a list of files. But because it returns the, the file list in a different order, depending on what operating system you're running on, um, you can actually get different results from the NMR analysis code based on which operating system, like Linux versus Mac. And so that casts some doubt on the scientific results of about 150 papers. Something that's concerning about this is that it's not necessarily the case that a good unit test would have caught it because um, not every unit test is comparing results between architectures. And so this is kind of a, a really, um, sticky issue of how do we how do we know when when something is 100 um, percent you know bug free and, and tested and working and, and in many cases this comes down to to working with card to show that your software is doing what you say it's supposed to be doing um, so that your science can be as good as it possibly can be you want to make your software as good as it possibly can be all right so now that I've talked about you know, why you want to increase re reproducibility, um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the, the community and the incentives for paying attention to reproducibility. This is something that we could probably have a, a good discussion on in, in this uh, conference. And you know, are we doing enough to encourage it? And, and how, do we, um, how do we work uh, with the fact that, that you know, how do we live with the fact that, that we're on teams that have real deadlines and, and real goals and we have uh, we have to get papers out and we have to, we have to publish. Um, there are you know, academic institutions that have tenure timelines that, that, that you know, push you to get everything that you possibly can do um, in as short a time as you can, but the reproducibility is also important. So we have to think about the incentive structures that exist in society and how do we, uh, how do we change those incentives to make sure that they're, they're rewarding people for actually producing better more reproducible uh, science. Um, we mentioned before, supercomputer cycles are scarce resources, uh, but not just that, we wanna have confidence in our results and, and we want our readers to have confidence in our results. So we have to think about ways to increase the credibility without actually you know, requiring that we repeat things. Uh, sometimes if you're done you know, on special hardware with a quantum computer that's only available to you know, one or two people in the world, um, you can't even reproduce, ability, reproduce that. Um, because the, the computer's moved on to its next problem. Um, there are a couple of agencies that have provided some guidelines like the, the fair data principles that allow us to, to talk about what we're doing and, and, and why we're doing it for um, increasing, the, increasing the credibility of our source code. There are also um, NSF policies on uh, dissemination and sharing of results and the requirements of data management plans that are also good steps in this area. Um, there are several publishers that have taken up the cause. And um, uh, here's an example from the, the SC supercomputing conference where there are appendices that you can put in your paper. Artifact description says how you ran it and this is mandatory. Artifact evaluation is a little bit more, um, is a little bit more detailed and, and, and talks about uh, the trustworthiness of your result, especially for things where rerunning is hard or impossible. Um, there are some 
some big publishers that uh, are also um, involved in, in these sorts of efforts. One in particular is the um, is the ACS Tom's reproducible computational results. And um, with this process, it's it's actually a really um, a really good example, I think, of a process to encourage reproducing results, because when you submit a paper um, for evaluation with RCR um, and you get this badge at the end of the process, you um, you end up getting a reviewer who is not anonymous but who works with you um, in order to to go through your entire process and reproduce your results. And at the end of that, um, they actually get to publish a, a companion. Um, a companion like mini paper that, that talks about the process of reproducing the results, which means that the, the person who spent the time and effort to do the reprodu reproducing gets um, gets credit for their work. The journal gets to show that it has a, a quality, uh, rigorous paper, and the reviewers um, and the authors, of course, get, get their badge indicating that, that it has additional credibility. So it requires effort, but you, you also get to see that effort. Um, and so these are kind of strategies that they create this virtuous cycle that we've um, already mentioned before. Um, since we've compressed our, our talks and timelines a lot, I, I don't have a huge amount of time to go through all of these strategies to improve reproducibility. However, um, I can summarize them all by saying that the good software development practices that we know and love are also great ways, are, are also the same ways that you can use to improve reproducibility of your code or improves of your scientific code and, and software. Um, and so this is broken up into strategies during development, strategies after development, and strategies during runtime. Um, during development, um, probably the, the, you know, the very first most important thing is actually solid versioning practices. If you're using Git and version control, then you already have commit hashes. But above and beyond that, Git lets you create tags. You can use those tags and make up tags every time you do a new run. And it's actually uh, not a bad idea to do that because then you are always able to trace back the lineage of your runs. It works even better if when you do a run and you produce an output file, the output file can say what tagged version or what commit version um, of the source code was used when that was run. Um, of course, that means you also have to keep your, um, you, have to, you have to make a commit to your code before you run it, and that's not often done. Um, and you also have to, um, it's also a great practice if you keep your, your tests and your documentation in sync with your code so that you can you know, move everything forward as one uh, package that's running. Um, you also want to try and follow good coding standards and build in quality to your code from the start. Um, and this is not just coding style, but also kind of what is the expectation for people who are adding to your project? Um, what kind of documentation? What kind of tests? And of course, as your code gets uh, results that are more and more important, you should spend more and more effort on uh, the testing process and showing that your code is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Another easy, well, another great way to, to get quality into your code is by practicing peer review. Um, during development, uh, there are some numerical issues that you should watch out with, with floating point precision or integer rounding. Um, probably we're, we're aware of these and we can think of, of you know, great ways to, to look at and, and analyze them. Um, Testing, we've talked a lot about testing, so there were some talks on that already. Um, something that is important to keep in mind is that you're not necessarily just having to test your code. Um, you might wanna make sure that you have some tests that cover the state of your system, because if you're working on a, a computing system, um, sometimes the, the libraries and the, the modules and the, the, the kernel versions of, of that compute system that you're working on are, are updating. So you wanna test that everything is still as you expect. Uh, kind of the base level system. You can, we can digress on, on physics-based tests. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but, but there are physical ways to, there's information in your physic, the physics of your problem sometimes that can help you to devise tests. Um, and there's also, there's also a way to think about tests where you, you check that your inputs and your outputs are conforming to your expectations. Um, and those are nice tests to have because like assertions in your code, people, a lot of people um, work with those and, and understand them pretty well. Um, now during experiments, uh, this is also some important stuff to keep in mind. Um, and I wanna summarize all of the, the information on improving reproducibility during experiments. 
as saying that this is like having a great data management plan. Um, it might not it might not sound like the most fun thing to do, but in fact, um, we had I think on day one of this conference um, a great talk about just the the workflow that takes source data from outside inputs and and moves it through transformation phases and and outputs it to final data products, capturing the steps in that workflow um, either by writing it down in your notebook uh, like an actual pen and paper laboratory notebook or keeping it in scripts and version controlling those scripts is a great way to um, is a great way to show how your data is flowing. You also as you're as you're building um, as you're building up your science, if you're scaling to larger system sizes, you want to try and have an idea of how big your inputs and outputs are and what data products you want to keep. Um, if you know that your final code is going to produce a terabyte of output data, um, maybe you want to try and, and save some intermediate um, checkpoints along there to use as, as part of your validation process. All right, so be thorough and capture. All those things are kind of... Um, Provenance is, they're related to provenance, which is just showing the chain of events that led to the output that you have. Um, so if you can show, you know, what steps ran to it, what, what versions of, of um, external utilities and tools and libraries all went into those steps, um, all that is great to show um, all the information that went into your outputs. Okay, and, um, and capturing and documenting all of this, uh, obviously, even after your experiment's done, you want to have a long-term storage plan. There are some tools. This is a, a small tool list, and probably from the things that I've heard at this conference, we should add some more tools to this list. Um, and just to summarize, the, the credibility of your science derives from the credibility of your code and your process. And because um, we, we want more credibility and we want better, better science and, and more reproducible science, um, stakeholders are rationing up expectations for reproducibility. We also have great uh, design strategies um, that I've talked about a little bit for improving reproducibility and, and testing in all the phases of your science process. And uh, these are really closely linked to better development practices. All right, so I'm moving through these kind of quickly and uh, now I'm gonna summarize for the day and we'll have time to, to ask questions and do an interactive session afterwards. Looks like I did get a bunch of questions for this though. So maybe I should take some time to do that. There's, there's a question from William in the chat. Are you using automated scanning tools for peer code reviews? And if so, what are your recommendations? I don't have any experience using automated scanning tools. Um, actually, I wanna take that back. I have looked at um, sorcery.io, which is a, it's a, it's a tool that scans through your Python and tells you what your readability for your code is. And, and it's nice. I mean, it gives you some inputs on your code. Um, but I think for now, there's not really a substitute for actually having a, a human that you can talk to because sometimes the problem is not necessarily your code. It's, it's more, you know, are you, are you putting the, the updates into the right place and are you structuring your, your work the right way? All right, so skip, don't get over time. Um, oh, and there's other resources and these are also on the web page. And, and also feel free to go back and, and look at these um, slides as they exist in the web page and use them for checklists and creating your own process. Uh, to summarize, 